Thank you so much for joining us, everyone, um, here at the Center for Conservative Women. My name is Julie, and I organize webinars like this one. But before we begin, if you're new to our organization, um, our mission is to prepare young women for effective leadership in the conservative movement. And we'd like to promote leading conservative women. Um, some of the ways we do that is through webinars like this one, lectures on college campuses, summits across the country, and our internship program here in the office. We also like to encourage everyone who's watching, supporter or student, to just be an active ambassador of conservative philosophy wherever you might find yourself, whether that's on a university campus or in your workplace or just your local community. If you'd like to learn more about our organization, please visit our website at cblwomen.org and follow us on our social media platforms at the handle cblwomen. We're also currently accepting internship applications for the fall semester, so get those in now if you'd like to be joining us here in the fall. And speaking of interns, um, our summer intern Marley Kerr is joining me today. Marley is from Ohio and she is currently a junior at Hillsdale College. She's majoring in politics and she has a minor in religion. We're very thankful to have Marley with us this summer. Thank you again for joining us today as we host Joy Pullman. Joy Pullman is executive editor of The Federalist, a happy wife and mother of six children. Pullman is the author of The Education Invasion, How Common Core Fights Parents for Control of American Kids. In 2013-14, Pullman won a Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship for in-depth reporting on Common Core national education mandates. She's currently working on a new book titled How to Control the Internet So It Doesn't Control You. Joy is a graduate of the Hillsdale College Honors in Journalism programs. Today, Joy will be speaking about how to develop skills to resist liberal propaganda in schools. Please join me in welcoming Joy Pullman. Hello, ladies. Thank you for joining today. I'm very excited to um, uh, be here to talk about this topic. I was really excited um, at the kind of ideas that we had discussed um, in advance of this. So this is uh, something that I've been thinking about for a really long time, but this is completely new material. So I'm uh, just really excited to talk about something that I've really been chewing on for a long time, especially um, as a mother. And people say to me all the time, <laughs> I was uh, at a conservative event um, in my state on Tuesday and the folks said to me, how do you have any kids? You look like you're still in college. So I appreciate that. But I in fact do have children um, and I do have six of them and I don't exactly know how that all happened. But as a mother, um, it has really become a lot more important to me to really think through the, the things that affect who we are as people and what shapes how, how we change, um, how we grow. Um, so I know that certainly throughout my college years and um, in the decade after, I've done a lot of personal growth, a lot of shifting around a lot of my opinions. Um, and, and so I've done a lot of thinking about kind of what are the influences and ways um, that people do shift their opinions over time. So I know a lot of, especially um, college students are really interested in psychology, what makes people tick and learning about those interrelationship things. And so, um, especially since uh, my field of expertise, such as it is, is in education, um, as, and my husband and I actually are, are the founders of a classical school, so we've done a lot of thinking about what are the institutional ways and uh, what are the things that the structures of society that we don't see that really do affect how we think, how we live, our ways of life. And so I think this is something that's really not discussed, um, just period, right now. There's a lot of... Um, you know, discussion about the things that are really visible that, you know, and, and we hear a lot of talk on the left about institutional power structures, about society, about, but um, I don't think people, I mean, the sorts of things that shift how you think and strongly effective, I think a lot of them are a lot more subtle than people are really um, aware of. I guess that's a bit of, you know, I'm kind of the saying the same thing, right? The, the things that um, I think a lot of the way that we think um, actually happens in ways that we are not conscious is happening. So I think that if we talk about some of those things and bring them to light and take an, and examine that, then that really will help us understand the influences on our own thinking, on our culture, um, and it will allow us to really be um, more active participants in the process of um, uh, thinking through our belief systems and defending and protecting them. So I mean, so let's go ahead and have that. So today I actually, usually I don't have quite um, so many things, but I did come up with kind of seven things that I wanted to talk about, ways that I would, you know, seven ways to defend against um, indoctrination. But before we kind of get into that, I wanted to talk about the whole idea of um, psychological influence on manipulation, on indoctrination, because there's a lot of talk about that in conservatism. You know, you, I mean, if you just read, 
you know, like I do all the time as part of my job, people, parents, um, you know, donors to um, colleges, people who, who fund conservative institutions are very concerned about the effect of um, a young person, you know, going off to college. And then I, I just actually had a couple weeks ago, a mother on the phone with me, a longtime friend, talked to me about um, what, you know, people, you know, people even who have very strong moral, um, you know, backing who have open discussions in their home about what they believe in, why. She said to me, it's like invasion of the body snatchers, you know, so there is a deep fear among parents about um, very quick changes to their kids um, and very, you know, and really not, not quick, but uh, not only quick, but also um, very deep, you know, substantive changes to their children that they really weren't expecting. It really throws people for a loop. And I think it's fair for um, it to do that. But I really don't want to approach this issue from a um, solely a defensive sort of way. Um, so I wanted to make it really clear from the outset that I believe um, the whole point of, you know, resisting being indoctrinated or resisting certain ideas is, is, is founded in a search for truth and a commitment to goodness and excellence. So I don't want to be in a defensive, fearful crouch. I do think, um, you know, that positive engagement, um, that, that really having confidence in, in your beliefs is a really important um, part of this, as well as, you know, I personally have a, uh, you know, a commitment to objective reality. And I actually think, you know, that my, my political philosophy, my conservatism is a reflection of my personal commitment to objective truth, to objective moral goodness, to um, objective beauty in the world. Those are called, you know, the three tra th transcendentals. If you go to a decent college like Marley does, you will have heard about them. But um, I, I know lots of people don't have as great an education as they really deserve. Um, so those are ancient philosophical commitments um, that are really a part of the heritage that we as Americans have as a part of the Western world. And the reason that, that they're important is that they for centuries have really been bulwarks against um, falling into attractive evil. Um, so, so I wanted to really make clear from the outset that I don't want to be talking today or encouraging people um, to approach um, to approach idea engagement from a defensive, scared, frightful crouch. Although I think it is, there are some legitimate reasons, you know, because um, the ideology that I disagree with, that I oppose, I do think it hurts people, that it is evil, um, and very obviously so nowadays. You know, so there is some level of fear that is appropriate, and if you wouldn't have it, you would be a fool. But I do think that what's stronger than fear is loving something that is really good. And so we, so we want, so the reason that, and so it's kind of like if you think about um, the best kind of soldier um, is not someone who's a mercenary who's just paying to do a job. Um, the best kind of soldier is someone who, who loves what he's fighting for. So, you know, I, you know, we want to have you know, t physical, tactical, actual military um, soldiers um, defending their homeland and their country. They're going to be the ones who are the most effective um, because they're fighting for something. And I feel that same way intellectually. Um, you know, I am fighting for the things that I love. And the reason that we are even talking about this ta um, topic at all is because of our love, our love for what is good and our wish to preserve, enhance, communicate, and preserve it in our own lives as much as we can. So as we talk about this, um, it's, you know, there, I'm going to include, um, you know, defensive sorts of ways of thinking, but I also am going to include offensive. And so not in terms of, oh, that offends me, of course, but offensive is in proactive, engaging, positive steps to take um, as in defense of the, the, the things that you love and your deep moral commitments um, that are really important to preserving you, to protect them from basically being cheated away from you. So there's a lot of um, um, emotional tricks that are often used to that and and to shake people um, away from um, what is really what is really good and what is really true. So what we're going to do is talk about how to notice those emotional tricks, how to no, notice rhetorical slates of hand, and so therefore really be better at um, protecting your mind and so that it can continue to adhere to what is good, grow in truth, wisdom, um, and a love for what is beautiful from that really positive stance. So let's go ahead then and talk about um, 
I think I think I might. I'll just I'll I'll, I'll um, read the list of the seven things that I wanted to talk about today, and then I will go through them one by one, kind of explaining which one of them. So um, I don't I don't know if people take notes on Zoom meetings. I might be, be the kind of person who does that, but it's just completely up to you. Um, so, but I'll I'll make sure to to not race through it, so that if you are doing that, or you want to just think about them as as I list them, that you have the opportunity. So the first one that I, I, I wrote down was learn to consider claims without accepting them. The second one is search for verifiable facts. The third is triangulate the truth by assuming the opposite of the narrative. That's one of my new favorites. Fourth, be careful who you associate with. Five, cultivate reliable sources. Six, read old books. And number seven, feed yourself with truth, goodness, and beauty. So again, so if we think about um, our, our political conservative as stemming from our moral commitment to what is good, so I'm not just, uh, I actually don't always consider myself a Republican, um, but I, I, I typically vote Republican. So, but, but again, as I, I don't consider that the core part of my identity. What I consider the core part of my identity is my commitment to, first of all, my faith, but my faith, uh, my Christianity is, is I see that as um, kind of feeding the other commitments that I have in life that include my political commitments. So the reason that I am a conservative is because, uh, you know, of the love that I have for, for example, human life, um, for, for the commitment that I, uh, that I have to, um, what do I have a commitment to? I, I have a commitment to the natural rights regime that our, our American founders instituted and created and I, I think made um, the, the, the best expression ever put on our messy planet um, uh, through the American founding, the system of constitutional government they gave us that is unique uh, in the world and in human history. Um, it's, I think it's the best thing that humankind um, has ever known in terms of government. Um, so, so because I love those things, um, I want to protect against being tricked into hating those things you know i so i i i think absolutely that you you need to have beliefs that you firmly believe are um reflect reality are demonstrated by the evidence available to you um that you really have confidence in so i so i'm not advocating that people remain conservatives or even you know remain in a certain faith um because they're using some sort of you know tricks or manipulating themselves to into being there but I'm really advocating that people pursue what is true, and I, then that because of that, I consider you know, my political conservatism, the things that I believe about politics to be informed by my understanding of truth. So let's look at ways to really encourage ourselves to, to how to discern what is true, right? Because that's really, really hard. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to claim that I am an, am an expert at it, but there are some things that I've learned through experience. And the first one is learning to consider claims without accepting them. So, um, you know, if you're in any environment, but especially in intellectual university environment, you're going to be faced with all kinds of competing claims. I mean, um, college life is itself, and it, it could be, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that it's not this for everybody, but I, its ideal would be, and it, uh, most it was robustly for me. I also went to Hillsdale College, I think, as Marley mentioned. Um, yes, yeah, she did. She did mention. Um, so for me, the college experience absolutely was a time of great argument, and I don't mean fractious argument. I mean people really enjoying the search for truth through dialogue, and that is what the I, you know the highest university experience is supposed to be like but a lot of universities really don't offer that as i'm sure you know you um my, you are those in the audience are aware um so a way to help re recreate and claim that um thing that i think is part of your birthright that you are owed from your university from your peers at your university is to engage in that search for truth and there's ways that humankind you know humans have developed for doing that that we know are more effective than others so one of them is learning to consider claims without accepting them so when someone says anything uh, e you know even something that i disagree with um you know i think abortion is a human right okay rather than uh immediately emotionally or intellectually reacting to that i think is extremely helpful if you can cultivate a habit of just pausing and considering it 
And, and, and that doesn't mean that you agree with it or accept it right away. You say, I am willing to, okay, what's your argument? What's your evidence? Um, you know, uh, your claim is open to all. So I really think that demonstrates your commitment to learning what the truth is um, without, um, it, without, while at the same time, so while at the same time you are um, opening yourself to discussion, you are not opening your mind to alteration until, you know, someone has been able to reach a higher threshold than just saying, I think what everything is the truth. So I think both of that, those dispositions are very good habits, mental habits to cultivate. Um, and that, that should be something that you consciously try to do is when someone makes any claim, no matter what it is. Um, and, and I don't think, and I don't, and I don't think you always owe someone a hearing. There are sometimes people um, who are not good faith, you know, they're not arguing in good faith. So that's actually kind of how propaganda works. So for example, in the Soviet Union, in China, um, there, people who are, people who are, um, have studied the art of propaganda know that by constantly repeating and saturating your mind with slogans. So rather than presenting evidence for a point of view, rather than, um, you know, com providing arguments, logic and uh, other accepted means of supporting um, a, a view. Instead, what they do is just overwhelm you with emotion, with feelings, um, with the saturation of that idea so that it seeps into and becomes something that you unconsciously accept. So that's what's really different about propaganda versus open and intellectual debate is that Propaganda tries to get you to assent to something without even realizing that you've done so. It tries to sneak it in there um, and it tries to manipulate and force you into beliefs rather than openly considering, laying the arguments on either side, looking at the evidence in an open, fair discussion that again, asks, really asks for evidence. So, so as opposed to considering claims without accepting them, what propaganda wants you to do is accept a claim without ever even realizing that you've done so, that's the highest art, or accepting um, a claim without ever considering the tr whether it's true and how you know whether it's true or not. So, um, so that's one I consider you know, very key way to resist indoctrination and to promote intellectual maturation, um, your, your personal growth um, is learning to how to consider claims without accepting them. And so a corollary of that is not accepting a claim, or if you notice that you've done so, um, then saying, wait a second, I'm not really, I, I seem to be acting in a way that affirms this thing that I don't know is true, or something just came out of my mouth that I'm not sure that I really believe. So when that happens to you, stop and think find someone to talk to who is wise you know look for more good reliable information about that we'll talk about some ways to do that in a moment but really developing the habit of examining both your assumptions and other people's assumptions so that when ideas are out there or floating around or floating through your head you are making it a habit to critically examine to seize them to look at them and not just passively receiving and accepting any old thing that happens to waft its way into your field of vision into your ear or, or any other thing so very very key um, defense against the art, dark art right there the second one that i all that i have learned to really rely on especially in my job so my at my media job at the federalist is <laughs> As you probably can imagine, it is, um, it's, it, it, to me, honestly, I, I, I do think it's, it's a, a kind of a component of information warfare. So, um, so when we're dealing with narratives that, the, you know, that are being pushed around in order to advance political power goals, um, one of the first things that I always do to try to help find my bearings and say, okay, you know, this person is saying this thing. Um, I don't know, uh, you know, Russia is a threat to the United States. Okay, the second strategy that I use, you know, first, so what I have done just right there is saying, okay, is I'm considering that claim without accepting it. Now, so in my, as part of considering that claim, I always want to search for verifiable facts. So what do we know about Russia? What do we know about um, the abortion issue? What, whatever the case may be. For me, we know, especially when I'm reading a news article, so if I'm looking for information on a new breaking news topic, one of my techniques is literally, so I will read the whole article and then just in my mind, I make a note, 
what is a fact that has been stated in this article? And to be honest, I've really noticed um, from developing that habit that there are a lot of uh, things, videos, there are a lot of articles that have almost no facts in them. <laughs> now, they contain assertions, they contain feeling statements, they contain wild claims, but um, it's usually people stating their conclusion while assuming a set of facts, but never telling me what facts that got them to this conclusion. And so I always find it really interesting to note and look for you know, if I'm reading just a conventional article from some, um, some leftist outlet like USA Today, what are the facts inside this article? So if we're talking about gun control, okay, how many people own a gun in America? Um, what kinds of guns do they own? Um, when guards are used, what are they mostly used for? Um, you know, in, 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 in um, crime or shooting situations, um, how many of those are, are, are committed with guns as opposed to something else, you know, like fists, like knife? Almost never is any of those kinds, I mean, just basic contextual facts that if I, so well, when I was a part of journal, Hillsdale, Hillsdale's journalism program, when I write factual news reporting articles, I always look for what is hard information that, that people may need to know to educate the public to provide a base of public knowledge about this topic. So the ones that I just mentioned, such as those facts about guns, are the sorts of things I would put. So for, for a number of years, I was an education reporter. Um, I ran an education newspaper at the Heartland Institute. So when I would write, you know, any article about any um, just news happening um, in a state legislature, um, you know, the state is considering this kind of reform to teacher licenses. So I would look for information that I could, that you would think would be, you know, applicable, helpful to people sifting through that idea for the debate. So how many teachers are there in the state? Um, what is the typical teacher paid? How long do teachers stay on the job? You know, um, how, you know, so on and so forth. So just uh, most people, if you, so as, as I learned from um, doing the education reporting job, for example, the average American, you know, according to opinion polls that have been conducted, you know, there, these are dozens and dozens of opinion polls finding the same results from a variety of organizations um, over, uh, and over many, many years, just consistently find, for example, that most Americans uh, believe that um, public schools spend one quarter of they, what, what they actually do. So most Americans think that public schools spend around $4,000 per student um, three to four thousand dollars per student when the real the real spending is well around fourteen thousand dollars per student on average and then of course if I'm writing about a specific state such as Nebraska I would look for not national statistics but Nebraska based statistics because there's a lot of variation in that but um, so if you're so if you're looking at a really important um, issue such as you know the, most state legislatures spend half of their taxpayer dollars so the money they take in, in tax collection they will spend about half of that on on public education, higher ed and K-12. So it's really important if, if, you know, um, if people in that state are reading news about um, that specific issue, uh, very important for them to know, well, how much are we currently spending? You know, so, and, and how much do teachers make right now? How much of the spending, in, you know, in a classroom goes to actually to the teacher's salary? Oh my goodness, you know, it's actually about a quarter of it. <laughs> Three quarters of spending on, on public schools, um, or two thirds of it, it, again, it depends on the state, does not go to the teacher's salary. It goes to building upkeep, it goes to pensions that for, for retirees, all, you know, all kinds of, it goes for teacher's aides, it goes for the Title IX coordinator, for regulators, for the principal. Um, and so, when anyway, so very, very important for people understanding a conclusion such as what should we do with our budget this year? How should teachers be paid in our state? People need to have verifiable facts to use to inform their opinions about that. But what you mostly get out of, you know, your conversations with friends, reading or in, you know, YouTube um, videos out of articles are just people's opinion. And to be honest, uh, I don't think most people's opinions are worth listening to. And I am always sifting for, okay, what fact, what information is this based on? Um, and, and to be honest, uh, many of the times, if you search for those verifiable facts as your technique for resisting indoctrination, so if something you might encounter in school, for example, you know, the equal pay myth, you know, women are paid 77 cents on the dollar. Okay, where's the research? What's the link to that? Okay, uh, is this, 
include the information that um, actually economists have found that, you know, that's not true that 98% women earn 98% of what men do if you control for things like how much time they, time they spend at work, um, whether they took some time off to raise children, the kinds of industries that they, women tend to work in, etc. So again, you always want to look for find, raise, and, um, and, and know the facts because fact-based information will help you have a more informed, prudent, wise opinion. And rather than you joining everyone else and being basically, an, <laughs> I was about to say an uneducated fool, maybe that's a little bit strong, but you don't want to appear like an, you know, an uneducated fool. You don't want to be one of the people who writes a 800, 700, 1200 word article that has three useful pieces of information in it. And you don't want to be the person, even for the conservative side, who goes around spouting off your opinion and it doesn't reflect reality. So in order to have that kind of intellectual integrity in the things that you believe and the things, and as well as strength in responding and thinking through the ideas that you're encountering, you want to have a good base of knowledge. Um, and to be honest, you just need to acquire that over time. So, you know, when you're 20 years old in college, you're not going to have a lot of knowledge and that's okay. That's perfectly fine. I am uh, going to be turning 35 this year. I still feel like I don't have very much knowledge, but I have a lot more than I did at 20 and it's been extremely useful to me. So commit yourself to developing a knowledge base about these important issues. And if you don't know something, look for good, reliable information. I'll talk about that in a minute. So let's move on to number three. Um, this is one of my favorite. I feel like this is the sneakiest, but it is, <laughs> it is, it has been the, uh, one of the most reliable kind of, I call it triangulation methods for, for guessing at what's actually going on. Um, and so this is the number three, I, I wrote it as triangulate the truth by assuming the opposite of the narrative. So, um, and this has been, anyway, one of the smartest things that I've ever come up with. Maybe, I, I don't know if I've come up with this, but um, I'm, I'm, there's probably other smart people who have too, but whenever some new thing is trending on Twitter, whenever there's some new news cycle, um, you know, whenever we're all of a sudden talking about systemic racism, when all of a sudden there's a police shooting, um, the first thing I do is stop and, th and, and say, okay, this is where the herd is going. Um, I, you know, that video is a very short video. It doesn't seem to confirm the conclusion that I'm told I must accept without reliable, solid evidence about this conclusion. Therefore, it seems most likely to me that at what actually happened is probably the opposite of what I'm being told. And I know that that, um, to me, it took me a long, like I, I had that suspicion for many, many years. Um, before I finally admitted it to myself that, wow, this is a really right, reliable way. And again, it's, it's not, this isn't a reliable way to prove that the opposite of the narrative is the truth, but it's a reliable way to triangulate, to make a, edu a, a, a educated guess. Because our, our institutions of communication, including universities, public schools, um, the, the news media, the uh, Hollywood and entertainment media, because they are so unchecked and strongly leftist, they are, are, are I mean, and, and for many years there has been no accountability applied to any of those institutions for just flat out perpetuating straight up hoaxes. And I could give you a very long list, it's actually part of my job, right, to do um, part of the Federalist brand to do media criticism, to point out um, when places just flat out lie and no one ever is fired over publishing falsehoods. Um, so for example, one recent one that just came up that um, my colleague Molly Hemingway was vindicated for. Well, there was, um, I'm sh I mean, those of you who are politically aware had probably heard about this um, claimed photo op that President Trump took. There were during um, um, the the summer of rage last summer. There were riot. There were riots very frequently in the U.S. Capitol, and some of them got very close to the White House. And um, President Trump, um, during one of these, went to the historic St. John's Church, which was torched by rioters, literally set on fire. Um, and he went there and said, basically, you know, we're not going to allow for riots and mayhem to consume, you know, America's historic institutions. Okay. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably most folks are aware if you follow the news at all, you'd heard at least something about this. And so for an entire calendar year, um, the media narrative about this, uh, it was based on the usual anonymous sources talking to um, corporate news outlets, claimed that 
it was President Trump's team who had ordered nearby um, protesters who were getting raucous um, to fire pepper balls and tear gas at the rioters that uh, came really close to the president. Um, so um, at the time, my colleague Molly Hennaway pointed out, there is no hard evidence. See, there's that way of resist resisting and doc. There's no hard evidence for this. This is based on the word of unnamed sources. We have no idea who these people are. And in fact, there is evidence that indicates that this is false, that it was not the president's team. Um, you know, th that, you know, no one paid any attention to her and that narrative continued. It was, you know, inserted in multiple stories over the entire year. Well, we just find out um, I think this was just within the last week that in fact Molly's reporting and questioning of that narrative was accurate and the absolute it is false that the president's team fired tear gas at the press protesters. It was in fact Muriel Bowser, um, Washington DC's mayor, um, who uh, her police fired the tear gas on the protesters and she even, Muriel Bowser, accepted a ward at which she claimed that it was President Trump's team um, that had done it when in fact it was her own police force. And so a federal investigation, invest, investigation that interviewed several dozen people involved, you know, um, who were on the ground, eyewitnesses, um, you know, uh, leaders of, uh, people like leaders of the police force, people who, you know, were security um, there for both the president and the local police found that that had, was completely false. So, um, my whole point about that is, and is so because of incidents like that, um, and, and that is not isolated. That is routine. That is routine. Like it just happens every single day. I, 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 you know, I could employ an entire 20 person staff pointing out things like this um, that are constantly running in corporate media. Um, and, and we do what we can with, you know, our, our, well, I think we're up to maybe 15 staff at the Federalist, but you know, I could employ three times as many people doing that. Um, so because of that, uh, on the job industry experience watching that happen over and over again, I have learned that whenever there's something um, really being pushed hard, um, uh, you know, really being insisted again with, uh, with either unclear or conflicting evidence or all the evidence isn't available to be in about these rush jobs, these, you know, Twitter things, the best way uh, to be honest, the, the truth most likely is the exact polar opposite of what we're being told. So, I mean, again, I don't, you, you can't verify this, um, but for me, it's become a very useful way of suspending my judgment, waiting, not rushing to agree with something that the left wants to stampede me into. Um, so for example, such as the allegations against justice, now Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh pushed really hard, but with my disposition of, okay, I'm going to assume that he's actually not a serial gang rapist wait for the evidence to come out and demand that evidence come out before I'm going to believe that allegation. That disposition has been extremely protective and fortifying me against believing lies and smears against people. And so I do and would apply that, for example, against, you know, and, and it happens interpersonally as well, whisper campaigns, gossip. Um, whenever you, you know, see a friend or, you know, maybe a group on campus, you know, that this, that, or the other thing is being, uh, you know, whispered about them, you know, they're unsavory in some way. You just wait, you, um, you look for, and say, I'm not going to believe that unless you can prove it to me, you know, with, with reasonable evidence. Um, otherwise, you can just, you know, go take a hike, I'm not believing it. Um, okay, let's move on to number four. So, number four, uh, kind of uh, is coming at this um, discussion from uh, this, this, um, this concern about um, guarding your mind and your heart, about keeping them committed to what you know is good and true and beautiful, about um, being wise, being wise in a very evil world that, um, I mean, it is not a neutral world, as you, I'm sure, are aware if you're going to most universities. It is a hostile place that really is working to change what you believe and change what you think and to do so with lies. Um, so how do you keep yourself strong in that kind of a hostile environment? Especially, you know, that's part of an entering adulthood, which, you know, at, at your college years you are doing. Becoming mature is becoming stronger to withstand assaults like that. As a parent, I protect my very small children from that kind of hostility. Um, I don't expose them, you know, they, you know, I don't, they don't know what rape is, right? Because they're very small children. That's an adult topic. Um, but, you know, when you are becoming an adult, it is time to, you know, sometimes you have to deal with grisly, hostile, unpleasant realities. And so there's ways to do that while maintaining your integrity and your commitment to the truth. So very, very important in that is being careful who you associate with. 
Um, I, you know, probably many people have heard the adage about, you know, a man is the sum of his three closest friends. That is absolutely true. You need to surround yourself, the closest people to you, um, it should be the people of the highest character, you know, of the high, highest, I mean, intelligence is important, that, you know, that's stimulating and exciting, but I would put character above intelligence, you know, always prioritize that. Someone who is going to be faithful, who is honest, who is not um, driven by emotions, and you should also strive to be that kind of person for other people. Who you really focus on integrity and character, and you seek people who have that same commitment and you band together um, because, you know, because having creating that social environment for yourself is extremely important. Um, I, and, and I'm sure uh, even at your, your young ages, you have seen, you know, when people start hanging around with, I'll use an old term, loose friends, you know, and I'm not, I'm not against fun. You know, I, I would go out to parties in college. I, you know, I still go out to parties now as a grown up. you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, people who start playing with fire, you know, who start, I mean, start doing drugs, you know, get, you know, too invested in, in dr drunk and irresponsible drunken behavior, people who um, refuse to discipline their emotions and their intellect, people who don't, con you know, aren't committed to seeking the truth, people who don't, you know, seem to have a commitment to what is good and, and tear others down and whisper and backbite. I mean, so all of those sorts of basic moral integrity markers you need to be aware of who those people are and, and, and really not letting them close to be a strong influence on them. I, it's, there's nothing wrong with having conversations with all kinds of people. There's nothing wrong with reaching out. But I'm talking about your closest friends, the people you spend the most time with and who influence you the most. They, uh, it's crucial um, that you really find good groups. So, I mean, so there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, obviously, I mean, if you are a religious person, I think um, the, the number one way that you can fortify yourself is continuing to attend your religious ser um, services while in college. And I wouldn't even say, you know, just once a week. I would say go multiple times a week. Seek out um, that strength, that community, those people who are going to be holding you accountable because we all have difficult times and we all are going to have a, need a support system of people to check up on us. And we also need to be the kind of people who check up on others. Um, so, I, I, you know, a, a religious and moral commitment is extremely important to nurture with the you know in-person commitment to showing up to those and putting them above other things but the same thing is true of your political leanings you know find or make or create professors fellow students clubs that are related to again you don't want to uh, you don't want to be friends with people who are insular clicky you know or uh, you know hiding out but i don't think typically that's the sort of tenor you're going to find among today's religious or conservative people you want to you know um you're mostly uh, people who in this hostile environment are able to publicly maintain those commitments are people of strength and so you want to again be one of those people and make a very serious um commitment and effort you know don't you cannot let that go to waste because um Whoever you hang out with will um, affect who you are. It might not happen right away, but I've just seen that happen over and over and over again. It's just uh, a human nature truism. So protect yourself, have good friends, have good roommates, have good um, people that you're seeing every day, every other day, um, very frequently that you are getting saturated with quality people, quality interactions um, of people. Okay, item number five cultivate reliable sources. So we're back to talking a little bit about the information, um, the, the war for your mind, truly. Um, and so as a part of, you know, doing these for the first kind of three steps that I talked about, um, you know, looking for truth, uh, look, looking for verifiable facts, not uncritically accepting any narrative, um, you want to, you will over time notice places that reliably provide you honest information. And so at the Federalist, we strive to be a place like that. And I, you know, I, we are not perfect. We've gotten things wrong. We've gotten facts wrong. Um, but, you know, when they're wrong, we fix it. Um, and, and we work very hard to do that. And we've been, you know, very, very low failure rate. And I actually don't think that we've, uh, anyway, so very, very low failure rate. And, and when we have a failure, it tends to be you know, a typo or, you know, someone typed in a date wrong uh, type of thing uh, uh, almost always. So, you, and, and, uh, so of course I'm touting my own horn, but <laughs> I can't help that I really do believe um, in the place that I work. But also, it's not just reliable sources in terms of um, political information, but also reliable sources in terms of philosophical information. Um, you know, excellent authors, um, excellent professors, 
um, you know, mentors, adults, um, you know, people that you grew up with and knew from your hometown, just you want to cultivate as part of your mental peer group, your influences on yourself. You want to be curating who is allowed to speak to your mind, who's allowed to speak to your soul. And so you want to be very, pay very, very close attention to who those influences on you are um, and cultivate reliable sources and search for people who, um, you know, even when you've read them and thought, okay, I'm not sure if that's true. Um, but then later you find out, oh, wow, they really got that right. You want to remember that. Um, that person has proven to be a reliable person. You're, you know, they're trustworthy. They've earned your trust. And so you, that's a place that you can go to for a haven in the middle of uh, piles of lies. So one way of cultivating reliable sources is item number six, reading old books. So I, um, there, it is not really popular to think about this nowadays. I don't know. It just has slipped out of our, our, our collective cultural memory, but um, old books and history and knowing history is a way to expand and enlarge your mind and your peer group. So when I read an excellent book, and I'm, I, I, I don't know, but I, I, I have this kind of internal phenomenon of experiencing that book as a conversation with the author. So if it's an excellent author, even if it's someone who's died, which many times it is, right? If we're talking about old books, um, I'm able to, in a way, have a conversation with James, Jane Austen, with Thomas Jefferson, with um, Alexis de Tocqueville, um, with, you know, great, amazing minds, people of great intellect and character who are, frankly, a lot smarter than I am um, and um, have keen insights into human nature, into truth, um, into, and, and they, and, and, and talking with those people, especially from other time periods, really is, is an excellent way of protect, as, as anti-propagand, it's propaganda hedging yourself. It's defending yourself against, because the lies that people tell today might be different or, or they might be phrased in different ways, but human nature and the nature of, of, of lies, of mythology, of manipulation is always the same. So some, and very often it is so much clearer, for example, to see how those, um, how those dynamics work if you take yourself out of 2021 and put yourself, um, for example, um, into um, World War II, into the Holocaust time. Um, so I, I did my college um, senior thesis on literature of the Holocaust. And so, I mean, so that's a very important time period to me. And sometimes, you know, sometimes that world feels so extreme and far away, but the, nowadays, I, you know, there's echoes of it. And, and I, um, I'm not saying, I, I'm actually not gonna hedge. There's, there's echoes of that. And, I, and it's something that one, the great philosopher of that time, Hannah, uh, actually, I was about to quote from Hannah Arendt, who's, who's great and who I, um, but I actually am gonna switch to, um, quoting Alexander Solzhenitsyn, um, who was a little bit later, he is obvi hopefully, obviously, if you know, the author of the Gulag Archipelago, which was part of my thesis. So he is a Soviet dissident. So even a little bit more modern. Um, but one of the things he said was, you know, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. So, and, and that really makes you aware that um, aware that these sorts of dynamics are never going to go away. And sometimes, you know, evil really bursts out in, in strong manifestations, but other times, you know, it lurks in more subtle ways. And so seeing how it popped up and affected people and made people crazy, made people stampede to do things that nowadays we think, oh, you know, that, I mean, and it is, it's insane. It's horrifying. How could, how could, you know, all the people, um, you know, of Germany put up with, having concentration camps. Um, or, you know, if, if we go back further in time, you know, how did the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, uh, it was, you know, no problem to them to enslave thousands and thousands of people to build pyramids for themselves, you know? So just these exploring old books and, and getting look, um, really understanding historical knowledge and having a base of that knowledge and dialoguing with the past and dialoguing with people who are in different time periods is one of the best and most strongest ways that you can prevent yourself from being lied to, manipulated, because then you are, again, you're developing your knowledge base where you can say, okay, you know, this person is saying this, but that's actually not true. You know, there, you know, this happened in the past that was like that, or this, you know, if, if we want to think, oh, we can perfect society by just getting, 
you know, all of the, all of the institutions right. If we just tweak enough laws and social policies, and if we, we can just overhaul the system. Wait a second, you know, that's kind of what the French revolutionaries thought, and <laughs> they ended up guillotining people. You know, so that reality check, that history check, well, is extremely important in making sure that you are not part of the mob, that you're not part of the herd, and that they don't assimilate you. So, and, 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 and this last one, item number seven, is kind of a flip side of that, which is feed yourself with truth, goodness, and beauty. So as I talked about in the beginning, you want to be nourishing your soul um, with good things, and that helps give you, it, it kind of like it reminds me of the Hobbits and the Shire. So you know, uh, those of you, I mean, I, I suppose, I hope that you all read the books and if you haven't read them you should you should read them at least the hobbit that's my favorite one it's not there's not so much war in the hobbit and it's a lot more delightful to read but the hobbits do something that is is a common theme in literature which is as, as i mentioned in the beginning and talking uh, in, in, in my introduction here they had something beautiful that they went um that they that they the whole um lord of the rings is about protecting the shire so you see that in the peter jackson movies the beauty the home the children the, the green grass, the flowers, the festivals, you know, the, the, the peace that they live in, that is the goodness in their hearts. That is something that they love and they're committed to. And that is the reason that um, they uh, have the strength and they have the will to fight and resist um, really evil imposing itself upon them. And so you need to have that same basis of goodness, that cultivation, that, um, that, that flourishing of an inner garden, of an inner life, that strength and beauty, um, because that is um, that will make you not only have a happy life, but also give you the strength to stand up for what you believe is right because you love it, because you love what is good, you love what is beautiful. And so you want to be, I don't know about you, but I want you to be, and I want to be, the kind of person who has that commitment to that and is willing to suffer um, and is willing to um, wait and think and um, not uncritically accept um, things that are being pressured into me. So. I need to check with um, my ladies here. I, I, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'm leaving time right now, um, and I'm happy to take them. I love Q&A. We have some that come in advance as well okay. as what we have coming through now. Um, what I really want to ask is this question that someone wrote down. Um, so we have a lot of propaganda, it seems, against conservatives in media, Hollywood, and music, etc. How do we engage in our culture without letting this affect us? Well, it is going to affect you. Um, so that's just one thing to note. I mean, propaganda and, and hostility, um, it, it hurts and it's going to affect you. So I actually think you need to account for that and make and, and be self-monitoring to be aware when you feel when you feel weak, when you feel I need some more support. Um, so really be uh, cultivating um, your uh, inner awareness of how you're doing and, you know, and making sure again that you have support systems that you know ways to cultivate your inner life and that strength to help protect you and insulate you from the inside out. And so that's the first thing I would say. Don't expect to be impervious um, because human, we are not impervious. And, and I, uh, the pressure is very strong and I absolutely acknowledge that. Um, so, um, so I think I think that for me, the confidence to really assert what I believe comes um, from having really a, a starting in college and then, you know, it's, it um, really has grown throughout my life, decided what I really believe and why I believe it. And so I don't mean every single nuance of what you believe, right? There's still a lot of detailed policy issues that I don't know anything about. But I have decided that, for example, you know, so my faith is one thing that, you know, I've committed that this, I do believe this, I think it is the truth, this is me, this is my identity. And, and, and there's things for that politically for me that are just settled issues. So you will want, for example, for me, abortion is a settled issue. The fact that men and women are real objective beings that cannot be changed, that is you know, there's really no evidence against that. And that for me is a settled issue. So once I have done that work of looking through the evidence back and forth on some of those major issues, um, then I say I have the confidence of my convictions and I say, I'm right. <laughs> you know, so if someone, even if someone is calling me a racist, meanie doo-doo head, <laughs> an evil misogynist who hates trans people or whatever, you say, okay, all you have is names okay, well, I know that you don't have any truth on your side and therefore 
I'm right. <laughs> and so once for me, once I know that I've examined the evidence and I know and I believe in my heart that I'm right, that gives me the courage to ignore people who all they have is mean things to try to manipulate and control me into doing what they want. That at that point is a power play. And that again is something that I've, you know, in my, in my life, I've decided I'm not going to be manipulated. You know, I might be quiet tactically, you know, I'm not going to go find uh, every person I disagree with and yell in their face about how stupid they are. In fact, I think that would be imprudent and uh, uh, have poor character. But what I am going to do is not budge inside myself because I, you know, have examined the evidence and that's what I believe. And I'm not, le and I'm not going to be pushed around by people using evil tactics. It sounds, um, one of the questions was, how does a young woman like myself gain confidence in their beliefs? And it sounds like the answer is basically doing the research and the reading and becoming so self-aware of what you believe that you can actually confidently engage when necessary. Is that what you would kind of agree is a good idea? Oh, yes. And I, and I would also say if you're a young person, you don't have to feel like, um, you don't have to, you shouldn't have to feel like you can just pull out an entire book's worth of evidence to prove your points. You can also go, you know, you can go, you can use um, simple gut checks, right? Um, so, so a simple gut check would be, um, let me think here, um, uh, uh, you know, a simple gut check would be, okay, what, again, what are the tactics that these people are using? Are they trying to convince me fairly and honestly, or are they using unfair below the belt manipulation tactics? So if you're aware of, okay, these people are pressuring me, you know, it's kind of the same thing as if you'd pick a boyfriend. If you, if you're dating a guy who like sticks in little emotional digs at you, or he, you know, tries to get you to do things that you're really not comfortable with, you should have your feelers go up and say, wait a second, this doesn't seem like a good guy. It's the same thing, you know, that's a gut check also in the field of ideas. Someone who's saying, who's smearing you or smearing someone as the substitute for good faith, okay, what is your actual position about this and why do you hold it? Okay, well, here's why I would disagree with that. You know, so I think that gut check is something a very, for me, it's a strong bulwark to say, if this person has nothing but basically emotionally beating me, okay, well, I'm not going to hang around an, a, 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 an emotional abuser <laughs> and I'm not going to give them any credence um, and, and any power over my, uh, my thinking. Excellent. Uh, next question would be, when a teacher or professor is pushing propaganda, what should I do? Do, do I speak out? If, if we should speak out, how do we speak out? And that's a hard question. I think it really depends on the situation, right? So if it's like a little comment that your professor slips in, you know, on the way to something else, you know, you, I would tactically let that slide. And then you also have, you know, you're in a really difficult power differential with a professor. So for example, if it's a required class that you have to take, and this is the only section, you know, you could get into, and um, you can get through the class without compromising on, on your moral beliefs, you know, I would say keep your head down, do the work, and don't make an issue of it. But if this professor is saying, you know, I am going to, uh, again, emotionally abuse students because of their different beliefs, I'm not going to allow anyone, you know, any free speech in my class, I'm going to browbeat people, then I would be exploring the kind of tools that you have at your availability to um, push back on that. You know, you can file an HR complaint, you can talk to the Foundation of Individual Rights and individual rights in education, if there's very clear instances of a, viol a university violating your free speech rights at the public university. Um, you know, so it kind of, I think what your appropriate response would be depends on the level of the things that you're being asked to do in service of what you believe to be a lie. Okay. Um, Madeline would like to know, would you recommend avoiding organizations or institutions that you could possibly work for if they have different beliefs than you. If you are grounded and have a strong center of circle like you were talking about, should we always place ourselves in an environment that is only like-minded? Or if we have these elements, is it a bad thing to put yourself in an environment like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it's a difficult one because I don't advocate like complete insularity. <laughs> you know, when I was talking, I said, you know, the strongest influences on you should be people that you really, you know, that are supporting you, that are building you up, that are encouraging you in intellectual and emotional growth, maturity as a person, um, and, and, and a deeper understanding of the truth and of your beliefs. 
So, you know, and, and that may or may not be some place that you work. And so again, for me, it would depend on, um, you know, how much you expect to be pushed into. So for example, would you be in a hiring department that's telling the, you that you have to hire people based on race? That would be a job that I could not feel like I could ethically do, hire people based on their skin color. That is more immoral, you know, I believe that's immoral. So if you're, if I was being asked to do something, um, you know, but at the same time, so there's higher and there's low, lower moral questions, right? If I was being asked to, I don't know, um, you know, put out marketing and I think it used kind of a cheesy sort of emotional appeal, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's just marketing, you know, that's, I think that would be something I could do on a job, even if I didn't agree with every aspect of it, right? So you will have to decide what are your hard lines. And for me, a hard line would be, you know, uh, treating someone according to the color of their skin rather than the content of their character. Um, and so, or another hard line for me would be basically being forced to affirm things that uh, go against my faith. You know, so if I was asked to um, stand up and, and, and or I, if I was asked to, you know, I don't know, lead some kind of work committee um, that supports in vitro fertilization, making babies in test tubes, and most of them are destroyed. I, I, I couldn't, you know, I would, I would be speaking to my HR about that, how I couldn't do that. That's an ethical boundary for me. So, so it, it and, and, but I think, I think the person may have been asking about, you know, can you work for a com company that, you know, flies rainbow flags all the time? I have lots of friends who are great, strong people who do that. And, and, and they're basically undercover in woke te big tech um, companies. And it is a difficult struggle. Um, but so far they haven't been, so far a lot of that for them has been um, window dressing. So for example, I, um, I, I, I know someone who works at Google who his HR department uh, put people, you know, ask people to do a drag strip thing for an HR company thing. And he complained to HR about that and didn't, wasn't forced to go, you know, so he, luckily he didn't have to lose his job over that. But also I know people who, you know, they're programmers, they're asked to change, um, you know, the language of some of the things that they have on some of their apps and in their code, you know, that it doesn't say, you know, slave because now we can't use the word slave. That's not a moral evil to him. It's just stupid. So he, you know, is, is fine with that. Right. So it, I guess it really depends on, uh, and, and, and so, but the people I know that do that successfully without um, it being a major challenge to who they are and changing them as a person, they have, um, you know, they are married, they have a good church that they go to, they have strong friendships. And so outside of work, they can say, holy crap, my boss is flaming, you know, flaming retard. <laughs> he wants me to delete the word slave, be like that as ever, you know, like the word itself is a bad thing. Um, so again, so I, I think if you have your core base of friends and your company's not forcing you into any hard lines for you ethically, you know, I, I, that's kind of where I would go with that. So it kind of all depends on what else is in the mix there. But I would always encourage you to have strong friendships, um, you know, marry and, and, ha and, and live in a community, uh, uh, you know, a smaller community where there's more like-minded people so that you do have institutional support structures. It's not only you and your woke job. <laughs> that will help you. I like that one. So it's not only you and your woke job. I mm -hmm. I know people in tech as well. It's um it's an interesting yeah. line that they walk and it's sad at times that it has to be walked, but yeah, it's, yeah, this is where we are. Um the last question would be um what are the top five books you would recommend for a young woman to read getting involved in the conservative movement? Wow, that that is a great question. Actually. I'm going to pull one out that's actually propping up my laptop right now. It's lifting it up a little higher, <laughs> but I'm going to show you the cover for this, but it's going to mess with my, uh, this. Now I have to, this is called Domestic Tranquility. I'm making sure, yeah, the light isn't on it. And it's by F. Carolyn Graglia. This is actually on my top live, top five women's books. Listen, it just got there. I just finished it maybe a month ago and I still have it from the library because I have so many quotes in it that I wanted to write down. I, I, I write quotes from books and I save them. And sometimes I use them in articles or I just refer to them. Um, so Domestic Tranquility by F. Carolyn Gregley. That was in a footnote of another book that I was reading. Um, and I do have to warn you, she talks graphically about sex a couple times. So I'm a married woman and I didn't find it, you know, it was okay, but it, um, it, you know, it wasn't, 
it wasn't like gr grotesque and it wasn't pornographic, but you know, if that is something that you feel would bother your conscience, I want to make you aware of that. You can skip through those, but she uses them to kind of talk about basically male and female differences, how they apply to our sex organs. So, but again, you're, you're college women, so I'm just gonna, you know, sometimes people have different sensibilities about that. So, um, make you aware. I really, really um, would recommend also Thomas Sowell's, is it called, um, I'm actually going to just look this up really quick here. I think it might be, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. Basic economics? Well, basic economics is great too. I don't, I, it's been a while since I read that. I don't know if that would be in my top um, this is this is one of his books about here we go black rednecks and white liberals. Yeah. That is excellent, and it really really goes through again empirical evidence on the race issue, and the race issue is obviously oversaturated. It's everywhere. The div divisions are so bad, and so one of the things I love about Thomas Sowell is that he really just diffuses that with evidence and with clear thinking in a ways that that kind of takes race out of it because he compares. Uh, you know, basically like white poor Appalachians and black, you know, uh, ghetto behavior and says like it's not skin color, it's behavior that's so bad for people. So that really is um, helpful. And he just, with his trademark, very good, robust evidence really can't, um, I think, argue with it. Um, I, I, if, you're, if you're a good reader, I would recommend Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. It's a very big, thick book. Um, you know, so if you can only get through like a chunk of it, it, it nicely has very short chapters. Um, you know, so honestly, something I do, I, I like to read a lot before bed, you know, so I can't read too much because I'm tired. So it's nice little chunkable reading. Maybe you'll be reading it for the next three years and that's okay. Um, um, so that's, that's a great one. I would highly recommend everyone, every American should read that book. Um, great foundational one. Um, let me, um, I, you're asking me to get to five. <laughs> Um, I mean, uh, I was actually, I, to be honest, I mean, if you want, if you, why am I, I'm recommending like really big, thick, complex books. I was going to say the Gulag Archipelago. Um, I mean, again, very difficult read, very dark subject matter, but I think a, some understanding of totalitarianism is a must for everybody, and especially you young folks. Well, you know, you didn't live through it, and your likelihood of getting good information in your history classes is almost zero. Um, I mean, there's so many good books to read. I'm sitting here thinking, you know, what's, what's on my shelf that I would hand to someone. If you're looking for history books about American history, um, a, a place I would start is um, with, um, oh, oh, Dret. His name just fell out of my mind. The one who, um, uh, Harry, Harry, the Harry Truman biographer, but there's also like, oh, and Pioneers, Dret. Um, David McCullough. There we go. David McCullough has written a bunch of really great history books for just like, so for just basic history, if you haven't gotten any basic history, there's also, oh, another one. Um, there's a, a there, uh, so I'll add six. There's an American overview of history um, book by Wilfred McClay. I think it's called the, maybe the American Experience, but also Hillsdale College offers a free online um, class with like 24 lectures, it's online.hillsdale.edu that you can take that accompany the reading of that book. So that might be a great summer project for you. Um, I, I've been um, looking, I, I've read that book several times and, I, and it, if you just want like a very readable, non-textbooky and non-ideological um, non approach to basic American history, that is unparalleled. Wonderful. Well, I know it's always, it's always really hard to ask. I, if someone asked me my favorite books, I, I couldn't choose. It would be like a list and it would be, I know. <laughs> it's so difficult. So thank you for giving us some of those. Um, we will definitely put those in the notes for people so they can just refer back to them and put some links in so it's easy for you to get them if you don't have them. But we really appreciate your time today. Um, it was very, very educational information filled and very helpful for our young women. So we appreciate your time today, Ms. Pullman. And thank you everyone for attending.